Hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start by saying that I'm really honored uh, to be speaking in this uh, platform. Um, there is nothing more important in moments of darkness, in moments of utter suppression, in moments when people are emerging out of massacre, complete destruction and destitution, than to stand in solidarity with uh, those people that have been marginalized. And I cannot emphasize enough how important it is also for all the people who have experienced marginalization to stand together and support each other, learn from our struggles, and work together uh, against those forces that have consistently uh, oppressed us in different forms and in different historical phases. So uh, thank you to uh, our Tamil sisters and brothers uh, for inviting me here. And uh, especially as a Palestinian, I am honored to be here um, and to uh, continue uh, this long tradition of uh, Tamil-Palestinian uh, uh, cooperation in the struggle for freedom. Now, my study of Oman was driven by similar motivations. Now, Oman no longer has an anti-colonial struggle uh, of the sort that we uh, are talking about today. But it did have a very important series of struggles in the 1950s, in the 1960s, and in the 1970s. These struggles were suppressed comprehensively, and although they were uh, destroyed in a certain sense, they also left an important legacy and made important achievements as well. They forced Britain to change the way it governed the country and the way it dealt with it. They forced a certain type of uh, a British withdrawal from the Gulf in one form uh, or another. <coughs> this withdrawal, however, was uh, coordinated in a way that left power in the hands of uh, the local rulers that were tied to Britain and that were connected to it. A phenomenon that I refer to as imperial sovereignty, but we can refer to it in whichever way uh, you, know, you want. It's, uh, the basic idea behind it is that it's for the empire to decide who governs the geographic space uh, uh, under consideration. So if we're talking about Tamil uh, Yelam, uh, that situation echoes very clearly because it's about the foreign powers deciding the fate of uh, 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 the people. If we're talking about Palestine, it's the same concept. And in the case of Oman, of course, uh, there were some similarities. Now, there are differences. You know, cases like Palestine, for example, there are settler colonial cases, whereas a case like Oman was not a settler colonial case, it was a case of colonial management. But we have one commonality at the heart of it, which is Britain had decided that it gets to say who rules in these uh, zones that it used to uh, control. In all of the struggles we're talking about then, there's a certain fight over sovereignty. And there's different notions of sovereignty at play. The imperialists view sovereignty as located ultimately in themselves and in the rulers. So they would say, for example, that the government in Colombo is the sovereign body in the Sri Lankan state. They would say that the sovereignty resides there. Yeah. In the case of Oman, they would say that the sultan is the sovereign. In contrast, popular movements have a different notion of sovereignty. And certainly, the revolutionaries in Oman had a notion of sovereignty that locates it in the people, so as opposed to their ruler. In fact, their fight was about achieving that popular sovereignty. They were saying, we don't want to have one dude <coughs> sitting on some throne representing the whole claiming to represent the whole nation, claiming to rule uh, uh, the whole nation and to hold its best interests 
and uh, themselves. You know, that's an antiquated notion. It doesn't make sense. People have to have a say in the process of governance. They have to be able to form their own governments as they wish. And that very basic demand was not something that the British were willing to give to the Omani people, or quite frankly, to any of the other peoples they governed in the Middle East. Because for them, the region had to be controlled. The purpose was not to democratize the region. It wasn't even to recreate the region in the image of themselves. You know, a lot of the British officials were people that would have been horrified if there wasn't a democratic, uh, uh, you know, system in Britain. I mean, democratic in that very narrow sense of parliamentary democracy. You know, they, they believe in elections in Britain. But when they're dealing with these inferior races, for example, yeah, they don't deserve democracy. Or they're not ready for it, which was the discourse that was used in Oman at the time. What was needed was to maintain the rule of the autocratic rule. In Oman, the rulers belong to a dynasty called the Al Busaid, and the ruler himself comes from a section of that dynasty that is uh, the Al Said. They govern the country. Um, traditionally, they controlled not only core regions that have historically been, uh, you know, central to the uh, Omani state, mainly uh, those regions on the coast. Uh, around Masqat and those regions in the interior, uh, um, you know, surrounding it, which is the mountainous interior. Yeah? They also controlled regions that are further away. One of those was Dufar, which is in the south of Oman. And there, the situation was particularly bad. The people were marginalized, they did not have access to any uh, services. There was not uh, a single school uh, open to the uh, average person uh, in Dufar. In fact, in the entirety of Oman, there were only three schools, and all of them were connected to the Sultan up until 1970. This was at a time when it was basically functioning as a British protectorate. There wasn't a single modern hospital. There was some kind of an American, you know, missionary structure that, that operated as if it's a hospital. It wasn't really even a real hospital, yeah? There were no roads. There was a whole anti-developmentalist outlook that was, that predominated in the country and that produced a lot of resentment. Today, that anti-developmentalist outlook is presented as something that the British were opposed to, and as something that was not inherent to the system of government in Oman, but in fact was just connected to the uh, personal uh, dispositions of the, of, the, of the Sultan at the time, who was uh, Sultan Said bin Taymur. He was quite an odd, eccentric type of fellow, and everything is blamed on him. But actually, that form of anti-developmentalism was inherent to the colonial system and it had served certain uh, functions that have to do with containment. A lot of the people overseeing that system were British officials that had served in India before. And they were saying that we lost India because we allowed for some level of development and because we opened the space for education. Sultan Said bin Taymur agreed with their assessment. He had in fact studied in colonial India. He went to Ajmer College, for those of you who know a little bit about India, that was the elite kind of Eton of India, and it's where all these princes went to study. He acted like one of the leaders of the princely states. And he definitely created a situation where the people in Dufar in particular and the rest of Oman in general were denied access 
to the services and so on, because of his belief that they would start agitating against uh, uh, the autocratic rule in the country if they start, uh, you know, getting exposed to the rest of the world and they have access to things like education. British officials around him thought in the same way. Now, other British officials had different visions. They wanted development, but they wanted colonial type of development. They wanted the sort of development that would reinforce colonial structures in the region. They wanted to say, look, we're building schools, we're building hospitals, we're bringing an entire renaissance, and this is all due to the great sultan, which is our guy. And that vision was embodied in, the, in Sultan Zayed bin Taymur's son, who currently serves as the sultan, Sultan Habus. So we had two contrasting visions of how to present that ruler, that imperial sovereign, that monarchical sovereign. Yeah? And both were oriented towards suppressing popular sovereignty. And this is what I want you to keep in mind. This is all about the struggle over sovereignty. Yeah. And this was not just some theoretical debate that was happening in ruling circles. Because there was actual stuff that needed to happen on the ground. They needed to take steps to be able to keep their rule going. And those steps are basically violent ones. Violence was part of the system back then. It is still part of the system now in Oman, in different forms. And the basic idea behind creating uh, uh, that, that system was that you need to contain any challenge to monarchical governance, whether you do it in violent or in violent, uh, or, or violent means, depends on the severity of that challenge. But the option is always there. And you're willing to use it severely if you need to. Now, in the case of the FAR, you had a situation where people were so fed up by the developmental, uh, uh, or lack of development in the, in the province, that there was a, a, a popular atmosphere that allowed for revolutionaries who wanted a more uh, a republican regime in place, who wanted to establish uh, uh, an anti-colonial state as well, who wanted basically the downfall of the monarchy and the expulsion of the British from the country, you know, these guys had now an opportunity because of the general atmosphere in which people felt frustrated around development in the fall, in which they felt that there was no um, uh, uh, steps being taken to alleviate their economic uh, uh, oppression as well as their social oppression. And they managed to start organizing across the 1950s. Essentially, one of the most important things that, uh, that influenced them was a regional atmosphere that was quite anti-colonial. And that, that regional atmosphere was created by things like the results, first of all, of the uh, Palestinian Nakba, Palestinian disaster after 1948, that led across the Arab world to a chain reaction whereby people were starting to think very seriously what had gone wrong and why is it that the Arab state system now is so enslaved by colonial powers to this extent that you could have an essential part of the Arab world fall so easily to uh, a group of settler colonists in a, a, at a time when, the, uh, when, when, you ha when they are surrounded by so many Arab states. You know, that led to a shock in, on the regional level. Another factor that led to the spread of radical ideas around that time was the rise in Egypt of a strong Nasserist character. Well, Abdel Nasser had launched a revolution against the uh, uh, monarchy and the establishment of the Egyptian Republic in the initial uh, uh, period of time led to many radical changes across the region. It was the first time you had a big Arab state, the biggest Arab state at the time, uh, uh, implement an anti-colonial agenda opposed to the British and the French presence. People were inspired by that across the region. They started building networks. 
and started coordinating with each other. And one of the networks that got built was amongst the ranks of the Dufaris in the south of Oman, who began joining something that was called the Movement of Arab Nationalists, a radical formation across the region uh, that included Palestinians, Kuwaitis, Iraqis, Syrians, you know, everyone was working together uh, at the time, motivated by a vision of expelling colonial powers from the region, transforming local regimes into uh, monarchical regimes, into, into democratic republics, and eventually achieving some form of Arab unity. This was the kind of overall uh, program at the time. They were thinking big. Not like now, you know, everybody thinks in, in terms of the, my village and my street and my whatever. No, no, they, they, these were very ambitious people that thought big. Yeah, their, the slogan they raised was from Aden to Kuwait, and they called themselves, uh, initially, they, they called themselves the Dufar Liberation Front. There were some, some of them were separatists, some of them just wanted, you know, uh, they had an agenda specific to Dufar. But with time, they, they adopted an even more radical agenda. They were like, we're the popular front for the liberation of the occupied Arabian Gulf. And they wanted the British out. They were inspired by the fact that, that Nasser was able to expel the British from Suez. They're like, if he can get them out of Suez, we can get them out of the Gulf. It wasn't so simple, of course, because the Gulf is where all the oil is. And Britain was not going to let that go, that part of the world. It wasn't going to take the risk of having democratic regimes there, or popular regimes, or republican regimes, or any form of anti-colonial regime. Any state that represents the people in whichever form, whether it's a Jacobin top-down model run by a strong president like Nasser, but actually thinking in anti-colonial terms and representing some form of general will in that kind of style, you know, like... Uh, the president has the interests of the, 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 the nation in that kind of anti-colonial way, classic classic style yeah, of the 1950s, that what they weren't going to have that. And they weren't going to have parliaments, constitutions, or anything like that either. So all models that would represent the demands of the people were to be rejected. But at the time, there was the possibility for creating struggle, despite the strength of the British presence in the region. Because of this regional atmosphere, people could access weapons. Because of this regional atmosphere, people could access ideologies. Because of this regional atmosphere, people could understand ways and modes of organizing. And one of the most important modes of our organizing that they, that they learned was how to do popular work. How to get people in a place like Tofar, where the literacy rate, rate was 5% amongst men and 0% amongst women, as in 0%. Okay? How to get that space united as a force against this regime that is oppressing them. Because anyone that came from that region and had half a brain cell operating in their mind, would have understood that this regime is no good for the people. You know, it's, not, it's not allowing anybody to get an education. It's not allowing anybody to, to, to move. And it certainly doesn't give a say to the people in the political process. You know, it's important here. We always have to think. There's economic demands, and there's political demands. Counterinsurgency people, they're willing sometimes to give on the economic front but they're never willing to give on the political front. Yeah? And the people in the far were fighting on board. They were like, it's not just about development, it's also about having a say in politics, having a say in how our country is run. They start organizing. They launch an armed struggle in 1965. They get weapons from China, they get weapons from... Uh, from smuggled from Kuwait, via, from Iraq via Kuwait, they get like uh, uh, all sorts of things here and there, and they build a popular front that's directed towards struggle. That freaks the British out. They start implementing a counterinsurgency campaign 
And there's two phases for that campaign. From 1965 to 1970, and then from 1970 to 1976. And I'll briefly talk to you about this uh, um, with reference to one theme that I feel we haven't covered enough in the, in the, in the panel so far, because there's been, uh, I mean, brilliant talks on what it means to do uh, counterinsurgency in both in terms of interrogation, in terms of assassinations. But there's another additional factor that we need to add in. So I'm not going to tell you about the assassinations and interrogations, because I believe my co-panelists have brilliantly covered that. I'm going to tell you about one specific tactic that is, that's essential, which is social division. As much as the revolutionaries were trying to get everyone united and get the tribal for example, boundaries between people destroyed so that everyone can work within one space, one political space. So, you know, they did things that, like suppress the use of tribal names and political organizations. They broke down the authority of the local tribal sheikhs. They were like, you come into the party, it doesn't matter whether you come from a prominent tribe or lower tribe or where, where you're, you're in, you come in as a member of the party. And you get your hierarchy through that. You start working together. Yeah? It was a space, basically, for trying to achieve some social unification and to overcome some of the traditional social stratification that had existed in that territory. Yeah. The British, you know, in, in contrast, who were managing the counterinsurgency campaign, their main objective was to achieve division tactics. And they understood that interrogations and shootings and all of that can work initially you know, for, for short-term periods, but it won't actually eradicate the phenomenon of the existence of a revolution in that space. What you need is to divide the society, and that will then defeat the revolutionaries. And this is a core principle in counterinsurgency worldwide. It's about isolating different areas, identifying where are those points of tension inside a particular society and aggravating them. Whether it's sectarian, whether it's tribal, whether it's anything like that. You want to increase it. And before, between 1965 and 1970, in phase one, let's call it, they weren't able to do that effectively because the Sultan was a bit traditional in his methods. He was just like, let's shoot them, let's kill them, and that's enough. Yeah? And that's what they were doing. You know, they were creating black areas, and if you happen to be in a black area, everything that moves gets shot. But, you know, British soldiers are literally killing everything that moves, yeah? But in 1970, they're like, okay, the Sultan is nuts. It's not going to work. He's like, he's operating old school, you know, colonial India tactics. That doesn't work anymore. We need to do something new, inspired by what we did in Ireland inspired by what we did in Palestine in 36, inspired by what we did in Malaya and Kenya in the 1950s. And it's the same people that were managing those struggles that were brought into Oman. And they were told, okay, now you've got free reign. They bring in the SAS. And you've watched documentaries about SAS in Oman. It's all about heroism and shooting, blah, blah, blah. That wasn't actually the main job of the SAS. The main job of the SAS was how to divide society and break it down. And things like digging water wells, which gets promoted as a humanitarian thing, was about actually breaking down society. Because they would go to a village and be like, oh, there's a cooperative sheikh here. Let's strike a deal with him. We're going to make your village a model village. So that all the villages around you are going to be jealous. We're going to dig the nice water well and you're going to have good water. So that people know that in those British areas, in those Sultan areas, what I call Anglo-Sultanic areas, because actually it was really Sultanic forces working with the British together. Yeah? Those areas, it's a happy life. Everyone else is crew. Additionally, in those areas, the tradition of society gets maintained and upheld, as opposed to these people that are trying to innovate and bring in new things that are alien and unacceptable. So they promoted a big Islamist program 
the British started the Khalid ibn Walid division, Salah al-Din division. I noticed they call that Saladin Corporation. That's the name of the Islamic con you know, the, uh, big Islamic general. Yeah, they were using all these Islamic names. They even created the Gamal Abdel Nasser division in Dufar, the British, you know, to manipulate. You know, the, the, you know, their biggest enemy in the region is Gamal Abdel Nasser. But to claim local authenticity, they created that, filled it with mercenaries from the local society in Dufar. If you were to fight on the part of the Sultan, you were told, you'll get a lot of money. And look how generous and nice the Sultan is. What is your problem with him? He's giving you the dough, he's giving you the good life, he's giving you the water. You know, it's those evil communists that need to be fought. So they promote then a material division between the people. Some people get a lot of resources, others get nothing. And those that get the resources are those that are fighting on the side of the authorities. Then they create an ideological, uh, 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 you know, uh, division between people, whereby they ferment you know, this kind of ideology that's opposed uh, uh, to that of the revolutionaries, and say that this is the local authentic ideology, that of, of, uh, of Islam, and it's a war between Islam and communism. So they frame, they reframe the whole narrative around it. Yeah? It's time to end. We've got a very tough chair here. But the point is, I'm going to end on one, one point, which is, the outcome of that was destructive for many, many years to come by creating those splits, by arming people against each other, by creating mercenaries from local society. People start shooting at each other. Cousins were killing each other. People from different tribes started killing each other. The highest moment of unity was achieved at the height of the uh, revolutionary period, and that unity then collapsed completely by the time the counterinsurgency effort had been, uh, had been completed. This is what counterinsurgency is about. It is about consolidating the state structure that is conducting the campaign and fragmenting those revolutionaries that are fighting for their freedom. And I'm sure that echoes with anyone who's been in a situation like that. Thank you very much.